So we're looking at Caravaggio's The Calling of St. Matthew, and this was painted right at the very end of the 16th century. And Caravaggio has painted the biblical scene where Jesus, who we see right here, he's accompanied by St. Peter, is calling Matthew to come join him, to become one of his disciples. And I want to talk a little bit about the, the type of background or location that Caravaggio has used to depict this scene. This is something that Smart History in their video also talks a little bit about. In the Bible, the place where this event takes place is identified as a customs house. But Caravaggio has painted here what really I think looks more like a like a private room in the back of some kind of sketch bar that the locals know to avoid. You can see that the men have swords. There's money that's just sort of been dumped out on the table that's being counted. It looks like a scene from like a Martin Skorsky film or some sort of mobster movie. And there's this very clandestine kind of effect or tint to the painting. And a lot of that has to do with darkness. And lighting is very important in, in this painting, really in all Caravaggio's, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But specifically right now, I want to talk about the window, which you see is kind of covered with dirt and grime, and perhaps even intentionally, right? These men have done this to block out the light or to, to prevent people from being able to see in, to see what they're doing. We get a sense of what's happening in this room isn't really legal, <laughs> okay? And, and of course, the tax collectors were generally considered not to be good ethical people. So they would extort money from the townspeople. They would demand beyond what was actually required for tax purposes, and then they could pocket the rest. And you could actually become quite wealthy from doing this. And you can see here the types of clothes that these that these men are wearing, right? They've got these pretty bright colors with the puffy striped sleeves. They've got the fancy hats with the feathers. So they're quite sumptuously dressed, especially when we compare what they're wearing to the sort of drab rags that we see on Peter and on Jesus. So let's look at these two men over here on the far left. We've got this younger guy who's counting money, this older man who's watching him. And you get the sense that they were just all engaged in some sort of a conversation that um, has now been interrupted. And this doesn't look like the group of guys that you would see in a, a restaurant or a bar and you would just sort of amble over to the table and interrupt whatever they're discussing. But that's exactly what Jesus does here. He looks like he just stepped right into the frame of view of the canvas as this light appearing in the darkness. And literally, because we see this light actually coming in above Jesus' head, it forms a sort of funnel shape like this, right? And it functions really almost like a spotlight that shines and directs our attention onto, onto St. Matthew. And you, what you'll find if you actually read this particular episode in Matthew's Gospel is that Jesus walks into the customs house, he sees Matthew, and then he says, follow me. And it's really quite curt, it's direct. There's no discussion. He doesn't sit down at the table with him for small talk and then say, hey, you know, I'm looking for apostles and I think you might be a good fit. He's very direct in his speech. But that isn't at all reflected in the way that Jesus is actually pointing at Matthew. And I want to draw particular attention to Jesus' hand. Okay? If you look closely, you can see that the, the particular gesture here, I'm going to outline it a little bit wider so you can actually see the hand. It's not at all aggressive. Can, can you even really tell who Jesus is pointing at just from looking at his hand here? And maybe he's not even pointing at all. It looks, it looks more like he's reaching for something that's just in the air right in front of him. And this gesture... I don't know if this reminds you of anything, but I think it looks almost exactly like Michelangelo's creation of Adam. So if you look at Adam's hand, it looks exactly like the hand that Caravaggio has used for Jesus. And what does Caravaggio then imply by putting Michelangelo's hand of Adam onto Jesus? And that's something that maybe I'll just leave you to, um, to, to think about, right? But I don't think that that resemblance is just a uh, coincidence. I think that that was probably intentional on Caravaggio's part. But perhaps the most famous point of debate about this entire painting is just who is Jesus actually pointing at? That is, who is St. Matthew in the painting? And that adds a, an additional layer of complexity when we then look at not just who is Jesus pointing at, who we know is, is going to be St. Matthew, but then who is this elder man here pointing at? And I think there's two possibilities. One is that he's, he's pointing at himself, right? So you can see his, maybe his hand is 
directed so that he's sort of pointing at his chest as if to say, like, who? Me? Like, are you talking about me? Or, I've, I think you could s perhaps argue that he's actually pointing at this younger boy to his, uh, well, it would be to his right, right on the left side of the canvas, as if to say, like, what? Like, you, you mean that guy? Pointing at him? In Caravaggio, he's so good at giving the impression of movement in his paintings. This maybe isn't the best example of that. But you can still get a sense of movement, even in something as subtle as the hand gestures that are painted here. And the traditional answer, by the way, and the, the one that I believe, based on how Matthew is usually depicted in other paintings, is that this man with the beard here is actually Matthew. So Jesus is pointing at him, and then the man is gesturing at itself. So what, what I'd like to leave you with here, and something that, as I mentioned before, is, is the importance of light in this painting. Caravaggio, he loved to kind of uh, paint in, in the dark. And we've talked about chiaroscuro, this idea of contrasting regions of light and darkness in paintings, as a technique that was developed even before the Renaissance, even before da Vinci. But Caravaggio takes chiaroscuro to an extreme, and to the point where the darkness dominates the canvas to such an extent that what little light we do see seems even brighter. And this is actually a, a technique that Caravaggio is usually credited with inventing that's called tenebrism. Tenebrism. There we go. And, um, okay, a little Latin lesson here, right? So the, the root of this word, right, tenebra, tenebra, is Latin for darkness. The term's actually Italian, right? But that's where it comes from. And this is a particularly apropos technique for depicting Jesus in paintings like this. Is the sort of light of the world that shines through through the dark. And it was a technique that Caravaggio would continue to use and would ultimately make quite popular during the Baroque period.